Welcome to the Virginia Woods. My name is Fred Singer and I want to talk about my textbook, Ecology in Action. Now, you might wonder why would someone write an ecology textbook? In my case, there are several reasons. One is that there is a history of insanity that runs deep throughout my family. Uh, second is that I truly enjoy writing. And the third reason, and perhaps the most important, is that I've spent the bulk of my time uh, teaching at a university that values teaching over everything else. And as a result of that, I've spent a huge amount of time thinking about how to teach ecology, and the textbook Ecology in Action is the result of that time that I spent thinking about how to teach ecology. Now, Ecology in Action is a textbook, but it's also a bit of a personal narrative. It's personal in the language that I use, which is somewhat informal, more informal than you'll find in most textbooks. It's personal in my focus on asking questions, which is something that I really encourage my students to do and something that I subject my students to on a routine basis. And it's personal in that I present discovery in ecology as an inherently nonlinear process, at least in some cases. And uh, my reason for doing so is that I believe that discovery is a nonlinear process, and I'm trying to teach students about the process of discovery. Now, the first chapter uh, contains the same concepts that you would find in most other ecology books. In other words, I talk about what is ecology, what are ecological questions. I talk about uh, what types of methodology do uh, ecologists use. And I talk about different levels of the biological hierarchy that are explored by ecologists. But it's different in several ways that I think is going to be informative. And it's different enough that I think most students will actually read the first chapter and subsequent chapters. And as a result of that, you instructors will have the luxury of knowing that your students have done the reading and you'll be able to spend your lecture time building upon that knowledge that the students already have rather than having to go through the book uh, point by point. Uh, what I want to do now is talk about the approach that I take in the first chapter to address those questions and other questions in ecology. Chapter one of Ecology in Action is different from other ecology texts in that I introduce the research of one ecologist, Tony Sinclair. I begin by introducing students to a young Tony Sinclair living within, the, within Tanzania and he's very familiar, he's becoming very familiar with both the animals and plants there and also with the people there and their culture and also is able to learn to speak Swahili in the process. Uh, Later on, Sinclair experiences some teenage angst. He's trying to figure out what to do with his life. Later on still, he realizes, hey, I can become an ecologist. I can go back to Tanzania and study the animals and plants that I love. So he goes back to Tanzania. He works his way into the Serengeti uh, Research Institute, and he starts studying the, buff the buffalo problem, as they describe it, which is that the researchers there believed, but didn't have any documentation yet, that the number of buffalo have been increasing dramatically over the past decade. Uh, Sinclair is able to show that this is indeed the case, despite the fact that buffalo run away from him whenever he got close to them. And he was then turned his attention to trying to understand why this phenomenon was happening. So he considered three hypotheses for what was causing this. One was that the number of predators had gone down. A second was that the amount of grass and the quality of grass had increased within the Serengeti. And finally, he thought perhaps the incidence of rinderpest, uh, which is a virus that afflicts ruminants such as wildebeest and buffalo, had gone down and therefore allowing the population of these large uh, ruminants to increase. Uh, chapter one is a series of hypotheses, uh, predictions, careful observations, ultimately creation of models, and ultimately uh, Sinclair was able to demonstrate that yes, uh, rinderpest was basically gone and the timing of the disappearance of rinderpest coincided with the dramatic increase in the population size of the ruminants. Uh, in so doing, 
Uh, Sinclair worked with many different researchers operating on many different levels of the biological hierarchy. He was able to later on show that there were important abiotic linkages and biotic linkages. Fire and precipitation played an important role in this ecosystem. And his most recent research shows that El Nino Southern Oscillation, again this is done with many different scientists, uh, is having an important impact on the population cycles that are operating within the Serengeti. So my point in going through chapter one in a bit of detail is that it highlights how I teach content within its context. The first chapter is a little bit unusual in that it presents the research of one person but Ecology in Action actually has four such chapters. At the end of part two, I present the research of Bern Heinrich on ecology and adaptation. And here you can see a sketch that Heinrich made of his ravens doing battle with some coyotes over a carcass. At the end of part three, I present the research of Jane Goodall and Anne Pusey on the world famous chimpanzees of Gombe. At the end of the fourth part of the book, which is on uh, um, communities. I discussed the research of uh, Dan Jansen and Winnie Hallwax on the uh, communities that exist within Costa Rica rainforests and their efforts to bring about the restoration of these communities. And lastly, at the end of part five on ecosystem and global ecology, I present Jane Lubchenko's research on intertidal uh, marine organisms and the research. Uh, ultimately, she ended up doing uh, becoming the director of NOAA and in that position she had to deal with the fallout, the environmental fallout from the explosion of the Deepwater Horizon oil rig. I had the pleasure of interviewing each of these people in person. They all had just wonderful and exciting stories to tell and all of the research that they'd done in addition to presenting important content material, also had a lot to say about the processes of doing ecology. So uh, how do ecologists come up with their questions? How are these questions evaluated by the scientific community? Where do uh, they go for funding? And how do these researchers work on different levels of the biological hierarchy? My emphasis on asking questions is one distinction between Ecology in Action and other texts. But most of the book is a careful exploration of the content in the, con in the context of asking questions. So for example, I begin chapter three with six basic questions that evolutionary ecologists ask. First, they, I start with how can ecologists use genetic and molecular approaches to answer questions about evolution. Then what are the basic four processes of evolutionary change? How can a changing environment influence the cost and benefits of adaptation? How can natural selection and sexual selection influence fitness? Uh, also, how can these same processes lead to speciation? And lastly, how do ecologists unravel evolutionary relationships? Now, the exciting thing about this is that the answers to these questions generate more questions, which we then explore, again, by presenting much of both classic research and the latest research within the field. This leads to different threads that students are able to follow both within the chapter and between the topics that are covered by different chapters. Now the title of the book, Ecology in Action, suggests that I am a big fan of active learning and I'm guilty as charged. The book provides numerous opportunities for students to uh, use their skills to think creatively about different questions and different topics in ecology. You can uh, refer to the website and also to the introduction to the book to see some of these features of the book. What I want to do today is to conclude by discussing one important question to all of us is how can we impart to students the skills that they need to answer important questions. So how can we develop in our students the skills they need to answer real questions in ecology? One approach that I use is I ask students to analyze real data sets. 
These data sets are contained within the body of the text itself, and also they're contained at the end of chapters in tables that I present. We all know that our students, or many of our students at least, are not prepared to do so when they start an ecology course. I have two solutions that I use to this problem. One is a box that I call dealing with data that appears periodically throughout the textbook. These boxes will teach analytic concepts such as data uh, extrapolation, error reduction, etc. and will also uh, contain analytic techniques or how to do analytic techniques such and how they work such as analysis of variance, chi-square, uh, confidence intervals, measures of central tendency, etc. So students will learn how to do this during the course of the book in context again as they learn about different studies that use these approaches. The second approach that I use is the uh, R programming language that is used to do statistical analyses. Dr. Ed Hamill has written a wonderful companion piece to the text that's on the website that teaches students, and in my case myself as well, how to use R to do uh, statistical analyses. And uh, he uses his own examples first, and then he applies cases from the book with each analytic technique that he teaches, so that by the time students are done with Ecology in Action, they will learn how to ask questions in ecology, they will learn how to answer these questions, they will learn how to evaluate different approaches that are used by scientists, and they will have a deep understanding of the core areas of ecology. My goal is that it's my and my belief is that students will realize that ecology in action is not just the name of their book but also a goal that they can achieve because they have a deep understanding of ecology they can articulate and come up with their own questions and now they have the skills that they can answer these questions